Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari 8 Z Flashback, a series of short playthroughs of the 150 games that make up Atari Flashback Classics for Nintendo Switch. Today's game is Tempest, a 1981 release from Atari, and one of their most well-known, most beloved games. So this was created by Dave Toyer, who we've previously seen on this series as the creator of Missile Command. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about Tempest is, like Missile Command provoked nightmares um, for Dave Toyer, Tempest itself was actually inspired by some of Toyer's nightmares as well. So the game was originally intended to be a 3D version of Space Invader, so fairly, fairly straightforward, but uh, making use of 3D vector graphics. Um, but that, for various reasons, turned out to not be entirely practical. So Toyer decided to make use of this nightmare he'd had about monsters emerging from a hole, and thus the concept of Tempest was born. So, uh, in terms of technology, this was one of the first games to use Atari's color version of its Quadrascan Vector display technology, and it was the first of many of Atari's games that made use of a system um, where you could choose what starting level you, you, you went on at. So, rather than starting at the beginning every time, you could start from a later level and perhaps get a score bonus in the, progress, in the process. Uh, so, the actual maximum starting level you could pick in Tempest was dependent on how well you'd performed in the previous game, or how well the previous player had performed in the previous game. So, in some ways it can be seen as a kind of um, a slightly different take on the continue system that a lot of early arcade developers were starting to experiment with at the time. Around the same sort of period we were seeing stuff like Vanguard from SNK, uh, which incorporated one of the first examples of the continue system, and it was so unusual at the time that Vanguard actually had a very lengthy text explanation on screen telling people what continuing meant. Um, but yeah, Tempest offered an alternative way around that, so it wasn't necessarily insert a coin in the next 10 seconds to pick up where you left off, it was just the next time you played, if you would got a long way, you might be able to start at a later level uh, than you would otherwise be able to. Um, and so yeah, that's Tempest. This has been a very influential game over the years. Um, and it's been picked apart and analysed by all sorts of people. Back in 1982, a guy called Chris Crawford, who was a, a renowned game designer in his own right, as well as a, a writer about games and a believer in the concept of game design as art. So not necessarily just games as art, but the, the actual process of game design itself being an art form. Uh, he described Tempest as being very intimidating to beginners due to it appearing to be unwinnable. Um, but that it kept people playing despite that by the fact it had a very smooth difficulty curve so it kind of ramped up in difficulty very gradually um, and that kept it feeling a bit more accessible to people who might have otherwise bounced off it. Um, the game is also incredibly influential on the career of one Jeff Minter, who we've seen numerous times on the various Atari A to Z series at this point already. Uh, Minter actually went on to create several official sequels for the game, including Tempest 2000 for the Atari Jaguar, often cited as one of the only games worth owning on the Atari Jaguar. Um, and that was later ported to PS1 under the name Tempest X3. Um, he then released Tempest 3000 for new one enhanced DVD players, if anyone remembers that, continuing Minter's long tradition of supporting hardware that no one had even heard of. Um, and also Tempest 4000 for Windows, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One most recently. Now, the story behind Tempest 4000 is actually quite interesting, um, you know, not directly relevant to what we're playing today, but may as well talk about it now anyway. So originally in 2015, uh, Minta released a very obviously Tempest inspired game for PlayStation Vita called TXK, and this was incredibly positively received by lots of people. So it was very obviously an evolution of what he'd been doing in Tempest 2000 and 3000. So lots of psychedelic graphics and um, fancy special effects and that sort of thing, but very obviously inspired by the vector graphics of the original Tempest. Uh, Atari didn't like that, oddly enough, because it wasn't an official product, but it had obviously been very heavily inspired by Tempest, and so they actually blocked him from releasing it on other platforms. So uh, to date, TXK you can only get on PlayStation Vita as a downloadable game. Um, however, despite Minter not being very happy with this the whole situation is understandable really. Um, he later partnered with Atari and developed TXK into Tempest 4000. So Tempest 4000, which is available now for various platforms, is basically an enhanced version of TXK. So anyway, we're going right back to the beginning of the Tempest saga today with the original game. So let's go play Tempest. Okay, here we are with Tempest. Um, I have a bit of confession to make. I've never really liked this game all that much. I know I know it's influential and really well regarded and sort of beloved as one of the best arcade games of all time, but I've never really liked it that much. Um, but I'm going to have a go anyway. Uh, you know, I'm open-minded enough to 
give things another chance and yeah i, I will say that i've always enjoyed jeff minter's versions i really enjoyed txk i haven't tried tempest 4000 but uh, i have no doubt that i will like it but just this original version i've kind of always found a little bit difficult to get on with for some reason but um well let's play it now and see if i feel any differently all right so here is the the rate yourself section where you spin the knob to change and then you press the fire button to start and then you're off So in Tempest, it's all about destroying all the things in the tube before moving in to the next environment and then repeating the process. Now this is one of the first games to incorporate kind of level progression. And so rather than the game just getting harder as you played it, what happened in this game was you actually move through discrete stages that were different to one another. And so you've seen already across these first few stages we've had different shape levels. We've had different arrangements of enemies. All sorts of stuff like that. We've got new hazards to deal with. Like this one we've got the spikes that are coming out and trying to do unpleasant things to us. Avoid spikes. So, I mean, I'm showing off the standard shot here. You also have a, a thing called a super zapper, which I can't remember the button for. That one. There we go. Yeah, so the super zapper is like the obligatory smart bomb that are in lots of games of the period. And that's very useful for when you find yourself in a situation where you're getting a bit overwhelmed. And it's especially handy... Uh, when you're in a situation where those red things are up on the perimeter of the tube. Because I'm never really sure how to deal with them. This is one of the reasons I don't like this game that much. I, I just don't know how to deal with the things on the, um, on the rim of the tube. Um, but okay, that wasn't super offensive or anything let's let's have another go so from the beginning I don't want the player to now the one thing you do have to contend with a bit in this port for Atari flashback classics is that there isn't really a direct analog to the original game's control scheme is the original game made use of a knob that you turn left and right to move clockwise and counterclockwise around here. So it wasn't quite the same as a paddle control because if I remember correctly it was a more sort of clicky knob. <laughs> clicky knob. Um, but um, yeah, so it had a bit more in the way of tactile feedback than the smooth motion of a paddle controller. But what you've got here is you can push left and right on the analog stick, and that basically simulates... That basically simulates turning the knob left and right, so... It's not awful. It just takes a bit of getting used to, because like a lot of the games in this package that make use of kind of simulated control systems, it's very sensitive. Again, I'm pretty sure you can adjust the sensitivity, but in, in this game you actually kind of want to be able to respond quickly. One thing that might have been better would have been if it adopted a similar approach to the racing games and had it so that you could point the stick in different directions to actually position your ship in that place. I don't think that's an option, though. I'll tell you what, after I've put my name in here... Let's have a little look at what options we've got available to us. So, where are we? Options. No controls. Sensitivity. Super Zapper. Auto fire. No. Okay, I'm just going to turn the sensitivity down just slightly. Okay, so there's no option to sort of change between absolute and relative control or anything like that. So, but you can adjust the sensitivity if it's a bit, uh, if it's a bit fiddly for you. All right, let's have another go.
Okay, already that feels slightly more controllable. And it feels like it's making slightly better use of the analog control as well, so you can sort of push a bit less on the stick and move more slowly. That's kind of what you want, really. So, yeah, if you're playing on this collection, I recommend fiddling around with the settings a little bit until you get a real feel for how they work and what work what works for you personally because this is one of those things that's going to be different for everyone because control preferences vary so enormously from person to person based on things like um just your own personal preferences your level of experience with games like this How much in the way of things like tactile feedback you want. All sorts of stuff. But anyway, we're not doing too badly here. So, I mean, I mentioned in the intro um, that this game had a big influence on Jeff Minter. And if you're familiar with Minter's work, that probably won't be a big surprise. Because there's a lot of his hallmarks in this game. You've got, we've got. I mean, this game isn't super psychedelic, but it is kind of a bit trippy. It's making use of interesting geometric patterns and abstract designs rather than, um, rather than attempting to be realistic. And yeah, I mean, it's. Even without knowing that Minter made so many versions of Tempest over the years. It's probably, it's pretty clear to see how this would have had an impact on him. Alright, one more go after this, because I'm not actually hating this as much as I thought I would. So I was kind of, this was one of the games that I was kind of dreading getting to, because I've, I've never really liked Tempest very much. But I'm not having a terrible time, so let's give it a go. Right. Off we go again. I've also discovered you can hold down the fire button as well. Which is much easier than tappity tappity tappity. I'll tell you one other thing that annoys me a bit about this game. I'm trying not to be too negative here, but one, one thing that does annoy me a bit in this game is... I, I can't see anywhere on the screen that tells you whether or not you've got a super zapper available. So I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to be looking to get that information. And it says super zapper recharge when you complete a level. But it also seems like you can use a super zapper multiple times. So Twice from the look of things. Specifically, but again, there doesn't seem to be anything on screen that's telling me that I, d I don't have any super zappers left. Or maybe it's just a case that you just get two super zappers, and you just have to remember that. Looks like that might actually be the case. Still don't understand how to deal with those ones on the rim, though. I think it's something to do with timing passing them by and their animations. But they move so quickly, it seems to be impossible to judge that. Ouch. Or you could just use the super zapper on them. Which doesn't always work, for some reason. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not 100% convinced still. Like I say, I haven't had as, as miserable a time as I was expecting, but... Uh, just for curiosity's sake, let's take it up to level 9 and see how this plays. It's 
so this is interesting. So what we've got here, rather than the kind of completely wrap around playfield, we've got a more straightforward, traditional, almost flat plane where there's a there's a limit to how far you can go to either side. And I've just got a huge bonus for that as well. And another one. So those who've been watching for a little while will we'll probably recognise that bonus as something that happens in all the Atari games that have this um, this skip function. So I forget Atari had an official name for it. It's something like it's something like skill skip or something like that. Um, but yeah, all of them have this system where that you can start at a later stage in the game, and if you finish the first stage of that later stage that you start from. Um, you will get a big injection of bonus points straight after that. And kind of thinking behind that is so that veteran players can um, kind of start later in the game without having to grind their way through early stages. And in doing so, they will be awarded the amount of points that they would have got if they got to this point by standard means, if that makes sense. So, like, there, I got to level 11, I think it was. If I'd got to level 11 from level one rather than skipping straight to level nine i would have probably got somewhere in the region of about seventy thousand points in most cases you will get more points if you take the long route um but that obviously carries much more in the way of risks along the way but anyway that's tempest um i don't hate it i don't love it but there we go it's uh, regarded as a classic and with good reason i can see why i just don't enjoy it all that much myself anyway as always thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects, moegamer.net, where I explore Japanese and Japanese-inspired games from yesterday and today, and videopackgames.wordpress.com, which aims to catalogue the small but well-formed library of the Philips G7000 Video Pack Computer, also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon, or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.